Gary and I were visiting a few weeks ago. I know it was a few weeks ago before he got sick. <laughs> and we were talking about songs and their messages. And I remembered that many, many years ago, I chose a Wednesday night. And this goes back long before I came here. And for a long time at that congregation, I spoke because I regularly spoke on Wednesday night. And uh, I spoke on a song as to the message in the song and what we're actually saying when we sing that song by taking note of the meaning of the words and so forth. Before, or because, I should say, because we sing songs and we sometimes just don't think about what am I saying. And thus, I thought it would be good that we do that today. And I asked Gary to lead the last song, I Need Thee Every Hour. I thought I would just do that. And I may do this from time to time. But I would like to emphasize, let's think about those songs because we're instructing one another, we're speaking to one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, as we sing and make melody in our heart to the Lord. So we need to be knowing what we're saying. We should be realizing the message that we're all speaking to one another because all of it's designed to make us closer to the Lord. This particular song, I Need Thee Every Hour, was written by a person by the name of Annie S. Hawks. She wrote the lyrics to it in 1872. I think you see that the whole song or the song standing as a whole is expressing our great dependence upon God, not sometimes, not now and then, not most of the time, but every moment of our existence. And of course, the idea is to make us more keenly aware of that fact, that we do need God every hour. We need Him all of the time. So if we want God's blessings to be upon us, then we will acknowledge this, and that will help us, of course, live every hour in harmony with His will. So I wanted us to examine some of the lyrics of this song to see the spiritual lessons this designed to convey to each one of us. Notice, uh, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. We all seek peace. Oftentimes, some of us who've uh, gotten to the elderly years talk about how we more than ever like things not to be disrupted. We like to have peaceful situations and whatever. Well, there is a peace that goes far beyond that. It's the peace that we have with God. It's the settled, uninterrupt, uninterrupted relationship of confidence and trust and love that comes between a person redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, a person who's been purchased with the blood of Christ, a person who has been washed in the blood of the Lamb by obedience to the gospel, and the reconciliation and justification we enjoy in the body of Christ, the church. And we're acknowledging that we need to be more conscious of the things that are said. We need the Lord to have true peace in our life. Well, that's a general statement. I need the Lord. Now, let me emphasize this. When we talk about a need, then we're talking about something we cannot do without. You need food to sustain yourself. You may overeat, but uh, you can't do without food. You need water. You need some kind of shelter, and so on. So when we think about spiritual matters, when we think about being righteous before God in this life, when we think about remaining faithful, then the need of Christ means the need of His Word. Uh, so that we can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because we know on the basis of the truth, by our compliance with His will, God is for us. I don't have to have God speaking to me and saying right now directly from heaven, I'm for you, I'm with you, I will see you through this. Why don't I need that? already had he's already told us that he's put it in the most permanent form in written form in the bible 
He makes it clear that he's with us. Well, I don't see him. Well, what difference does that make? Uh, he is a spirit. Thus, he's not limited by the things that limit us. He's wherever we are. I don't have to be in a certain position in this life before he will be with me. One of the great blessings of life as I've journeyed over the years hither and yon is to know it doesn't make any difference where I am in this world. He is with me. And that always is a great comfort. In the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What a thought that is. Notice, go ye into all the world. Where in the world can I go that God is not there? That he will not be with me. That he will not keep his promises. That he will not direct me in the same way that he directs everybody. Not just providentially in control of everything, but through his word as I study anywhere in the world that I can go. And in uh, Matthew's account of the Great Commission, he ends it by saying, I will be with you all the way, even unto the end of the world or the end of the age. Jesus, of course, is the one of the Godhead three who became man. And by being tempted in every point like as we are dwelling on this earth, he could offer his body, a sacrifice for us and us, to die on behalf of others, or die on behalf of all the race of man. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 6.23 or Romans 3.23. And that sin caused death to come about or separation from God, Romans 6.23. Listen to what he said beginning in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 14. Speaking of Christ, for he is our peace. Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, of course, he's talking about the wall, the partition between us was erected by the law that kept the Jew on one side of the fence, so to speak, or partition, and the Gentile on the other. But now he's made it possible for all men, regardless of their nationality, their ethnicity, or whatever, to be all united and one in Christ. And there's that peace. We need to understand that when it comes to the way God seeks to bring men to be at peace with one another. It'll never happen except in Christ. That's where it happens. One of the things that stands out so plainly over the years when I've gone to different countries, they speak different languages from different backgrounds, different types of uh, traditions, is that all of us worship God the same way because we were instructed by the same book. We all had the same outlook on things. We were all looking to the same book to give us guidance and direction to know what the Lord wanted us to do. And that within itself tells us that through Christ, no matter the human languages we speak, we can know the will of heaven. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity or hate, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Why did he do that? For to make in himself of two, one, new man so making peace why do we think we can find the peace that we all claim we want no doubt people do outside of Christ you're not going to find it in the United Nations I know of no human organization that uh, purports itself to be a great place for unity that is more divided than the United Nations it, it, it's just pitiful that people say here is a great example of how men on the earth can have peace with one another and we would do well to remember that uh, the only peace that's going to exist is when men abide in God's will. Notice verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off. How do you preach peace to somebody? You preach the gospel. God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. And to them that were nigh, that is to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And that's a wonderful thought. The last verse that we want to read now. For through Him, there's the avenue, Him, Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to one Spirit unto the Father. So the Holy Spirit, through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians six seventeen, extends to us the will of Christ and the words of Christ. As we embrace those words and understand them and bring ourselves in subjection to them, then we all live the same way. We all think the same way. That doesn't mean if you don't like boiled okra that you're going to like it the next time 
when you obey the gospel and everybody in the church going like boiled over. That, that's not the spiritual matter, is it? The point is, is that when it comes to serving God and discharging our obligations to God, being His children, being Christians of Christ, we all believe and we all act and we all teach the same thing. That's how oneness is brought about, and through that oneness, that's how peace exists. Jesus' death on the cross is what brought peace between men. Jesus' death on the cross brings peace between, of course, ultimately, God and man. For we're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. There's an inner peace that even when you're in the throes of persecution or you're ill and maybe on your deathbed dying of cancer, you have an inner peace because you have trusted in firm, sound obedience to the truth of God, knowing God will be with you, knowing that His gracious mercy is extended to you no matter what's happening, no matter the turmoil going on outside, no matter what's going on, He is with you. We enjoy the favor of God. God's children are special people to Him because we have heard the Word. We have received it. We have believed it. And we labor daily to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as Christians know their labor is not in vain. It's not pointless or empty. Where? In the Lord. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 and 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Listen to what Paul said, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. King James says, be careful for nothing. It means be, don't be anxious. But in everything, now what's left out? <coughs> but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, how many of us really follow that? And think God really hears us as we request things from Him. Oh, we always say, not I will, but thy be done, for we recognize Him as wiser than us. But God wants us to say, here's my request. And the peace of God, here's what happens when you do that, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, what will happen? Shall keep your heart, your inner man, your mind, shall keep your hearts and minds through, there's the avenue, through Christ Jesus. Put it this way, anxiety wars against our peace of mind. Always will, always has. We as God's children are people on earth who should have the least anxiety of anybody else. Nobody has what we have. I'm not trying to create pride in a puffed-up attitude. I'm trying to simply say, you've chosen Christ through His gospel to submit yourself to Him to gain remission of sins. He takes note of that. This morning we talked about that, comparatively speaking, of all the people that ever live on this earth are accountable to God for their actions. Guess what? There's only a few. You're going to choose Christ, believe and obey the gospel, and walk the straight and narrow way that leads to heaven. Thus, we have the peace of mind that the people outside of Christ, or brethren who have apostatized, do not have. And so by putting our trust in God, as it's taught in the scriptures, through our petitions to the Father, we can lift that anxiety. Anxiety experienced is a good measurement of how much trust and faith and confidence you have in God to take care of you. Now, what did we sing? I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. So we need all of that to have the peace that God expects and wants every one of us to have. He says that we need him every hour for help with temptation. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. 
Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. Now think of what that's doing. It's something we've already mentioned. It's reminding us, it's teaching us that God's presence, the very fact that we understand that He's with us, that He knows, as one song says, and He cares, that within itself help us, helps us to overcome temptation. There's temptation is used in the Scriptures to mean a solicitation from Satan to get you to violate God's will, but it also means the time your faith is tried, when your faith is put to a test. In either case, the knowledge of God's Word that says, I'm right here, you can't see me, but I'm right here. I'm closer to you than your own fleshly relations can be to you. Because there's no fleshly material thing separating us. And when you're undergoing these various whatever they may be, know that I'm there. Well, how do I know it? I know what God told me, and I believe Him. Jesus taught us not to yield to temptation. You remember in the prayer Jesus gave us as a model to go by for our prayers, in Matthew 6, 13, He says, don't lead us into temptation. That's part of what we should be praying. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's our prayer. You, you think of all the prayers we offer. You have trouble remembering what you ought to pray for? Jesus gave us a model. And though it's general, whatever you can pray for in your own life and the specifics of it fit in the model prayer under the general headings that are there. Depending on God when we are tempted is one thing that helps us endure. He's with me. There's no way from me. But I'm born down with all sorts of whatevers. <laughs> Where is God? It's right there. How do I know? It's like we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Because the Bible tells me so. That's the importance of recognizing the Bible as the all-sufficient, final, and complete, infallible revelation of God to man. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Depending on God when we are tempted then helps us to endure. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation hath taken you, but such as is common to man. For God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Can you bear up? The Holy Word of God said you could. That was written to Christians, not those outside of Christ. The Lord knows, according to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Blessing comes then from enduring temptations. Having to battle and to keep our mind in subjection to the truth of God and to make decisions based upon what the Bible says as we solve life's problems, all of that serves to strengthen us. We want to be strengthened. We recognize that if a person wants to be strong in his muscles, he's got to lift weights. Actually, he breaks them down. So when they reheal or heal themselves, they're stronger. We won't recognize that in spiritual battles. We pray regularly, help us to be strong, help us to resist temptation, strengthen us. But well, what does it take in my life to make that spiritual strength come to the surface and be there and be strong? It takes then facing certain things. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life. When he's been approved, he'll receive the kind of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James 1, verse 12. That's telling us when all these things come that put us to the test, or when Satan is soliciting us to violate God's will, to transgress it, to gratify whatever it is we may want or like, then when we resist, when we trust in him, when we pour out our heart to God in prayer, when we have the attitude of saying, not my will, but thine be done, God will get us through. Well, explain to me, preacher, how he gets us through. 
I have no way of doing that. That's part of my trust in God based on His Word. He knows how to do that. I don't. Now, we're children of God and the great family of God. I want you to think of children in normal homes where mother and they love one another and love their kids. The kids, if they have security like they ought to in a home, do they worry themselves a whole lot about the responsibilities of mother and daddy? Now, I'm talking about where things are working as God intended them to do in the home. They don't give any thoughts to that. When you grow up and you take on the support of yourself and you start dealing with as a husband and wife, father and mother with the rearing of your own ch children, then things will occupy your mind that didn't when you were a child growing up. Because that's the way it is when I was a child. I thought of a child. I was a child. Okay, man, to put away childish things. There's a responsibility God never did intend for children in a secure home to have. Pattern that, when they are compared, I should say, to the spiritual family of God. We trouble ourselves over what's God's business and not what's ours. Thus, we create anxiety. We just can't believe God really knows how to handle things. That he'll really stand by what he said. We can quote that scripture, but if we really believe it. So we get antsy and we're anxious and whatever. When the Bible's full of material, it says, don't do that. Don't do that. Put your trust in God based on his word. He will take care of you. And we need to do that in the times when they're good and the times when they're bad. I need thee every hour. Now watch. In joy or pain. Come quickly and abide. Or life is vain. Or life is pointless. Life not given over to faithful service to God is manifest in the words of Christ. is pointless. Think about it for a minute. All these people out here, and that's the majority of everybody. That's, you know, the most. They're rushing around looking for something. If you could just get a chance to sit down with them and say, what is your life all about? What do you treasure more than anything else right now in your life? Some of them might not even be able to put it into words. They just couldn't. But we know what ultimately it is. People want peace. And they want happiness. And they want contentment. They want to get along with one another. People sometimes <laughs> that are the most grouchy are the people who are begging <laughs> to get along with folks. Frustration develops. You can't see things as you ought to see them because you're so caught up in no telling them what. But if you'll keep your mind on the goal, as the Bible presents that goal, that goal then we, and I speak now to Christians, we have what the world doesn't have and doesn't understand. We need the Lord regardless of our circumstances, whether we're happy or, or whether we're not, whether we're sick or we're well. Understanding that God gives us purpose in life makes life meaningful. And all uh, circumstances, situations, understandable. Because God knows what He's doing. You know that before you start. You're His child. You're, his, you're one of the favorites. <laughs> you're one of the ones that has participates in all those spiritual blessings that are located in Christ. God doesn't hate us. God's not looking for a reason to cast us off. And by your own choice to obey Him, He sees that. He understands that. That's the purpose of this life. Make your choices. We're creatures of choices. You can choose to go with the crowd and be out there with the rats in the race. Or you can choose to embrace the truth and have that peace that comes by knowing Christ through the gospel. Notice what's said to Philippians in Philippians 4 and verse 4 along this line. And this is a statement to us. It's a state of the way we ought to be. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice where? In the Lord. How often? Always. Again, I repeat myself, he says, rejoice. When your sins are forgiven, you're reconciled to God. Heaven is your future home. Everything in this world, God guides and directs for you as you labor to abide in the truth. 
What else could make a person rejoice? In Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Can you think of times in your life when you could say, I have been filled to the brim with joy? Most of the time we're thinking about all those things that irritate us. We've been filled to the brim with other things and none of it's very peaceful. But it's there. We just don't take the time to note all the great and good things. For a person, not even a Christian, when you think of the population of the world and the state most of the world's in, there needs to be joy just to have been born in these United States. Why did God put me here? I think there's about a billion, six hundred million Chinese, about 360 million of us. Much more easy to be born Chinese than would be born here. Why? Well, they're not a privilege. God who chose that. Now, obligation comes with it. If he, privilege, if he gave me a part of that privilege to be here, what should I do now that I'm a Christian? That even makes me more privileged. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. You may abound in hope, expectation of heaven. We don't see that a lot with us. Now I know we talk about, I hear it in prayers all the time, and I'm not opposed to those prayers. Praying for this government, praying for this nation, and how this, that, and the other is taking place. Well, we in the church, as the leavening for good in this world, have in our hands, as the old song says, into our hands the gospel is given. We have the solution to all of America's problems. And you say, well, they won't listen to us. Well, the Lord, uh, it seemed like to me, they crucified him, didn't they? But did that stop God's will from being done ultimately? No, it all figured into the very thing that uh, made salvation possible. So we have so much to keep on keeping on. Where I am, I can't be in Washington or New York or wherever else, whatever. I can't even be in every place in the world, but I am where I am. And I can be what I ought to be where I am. I can be the light of the world right here. We can have great joy if we will open our lives to Jesus every hour. John 15, 11 these things, Jesus said to the apostles, I have spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. What does that tell you about what the Lord wants us to have and why he did what he did? Then you read in 1 Peter 1, 8, Whom having not seen you love, saying to Christians, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That pretty well covers us, doesn't it? No man here has seen Jesus Christ. What have we seen? The will of Christ. How he wants us to live. All the promises of God to the one who loves him and keeps his commandments. All the blessings that we have. And then in 1 John 1, 4, John says, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Do you notice how many times we read about that? That your joy may be full? Why don't we cap capture those things in our mind and settle on them and think about that? God wants me to rejoice because I'm reconciled to Him. I'm one of His children. My sins are forgiven. Heaven is going to be my home. And will that not cause us more than ever to spend more time with the Bible? Studying it? Bringing our thoughts and subjection to Jesus Christ. True joy, then, is a great blessing that we may enjoy. But notice it is conditional when we listen to God, when we study God's Word, when we're of a mind to hunger and thirst after righteousness. All of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. We, of course, need God in difficult times. We all face various times of difficulty to different degrees of it. We need to know that God wants us to be better because of those difficult times. How do we find it manifest in the Scriptures? James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, 
count it all joy when you fall into various trials or temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Have you ever prayed for patience? That is, to bear up under whatever goes along. Well, I'm learning here from God that I build my patience when I have to go through various trials. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, it can't be, say, lacking nothing in the way of this world's good, because that's not the emphasis of godly living. Lacking in nothing is spiritual strength. And the hope of heaven is a part of that. Whatever trials come our way, there'll be nothing when you compare them to the eternal life of the child of God. Listen to the way Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17. For our light affliction. Now when I read that, think of what Paul said he underwent. He says our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, when you take what James said, James 1, 2 through 4, as to how we learn to bear up or to be patient by enduring these trials, then we understand how he can say for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And then he said to the church at Rome in Romans 8 and verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you ever sit down and just contemplate? I, and you, I can tell you before you start, you'll never be able to form it in your mind, but it sure is wonderful to try and to think about what is out there just ahead for the faithful, for the true, and for the just. In view of what Paul said here, compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What was that sermon I heard the other day about glory? Well, it's going to be glory revealed in us. We are God's favorites. He's going, we're, we're, we're in a state of being put on the trophy shelf to magnify the love and the grace and the glory of God that he could ordain a way that sinful men who actually deserve torment, he redeemed and brought them to heaven through Jesus Christ. I need thee every hour for peace, not during temptation, in joy or pain, this is the gist of this song. I need the every hour for identifying with Jesus. Now that terminology, I identify with Christ, doesn't get used too much. It gets, it gets used in a lot of other ways. It seems like we missed it. Or I identify with this. Or I identify. Well, why don't you? It seems like to me, let's put it this way, the God's, God's family, the, the, the members of the church, ought to identify with Christ. And the New Testament tells us how to identify with Christ. Everybody's identifying with somebody. Let's identify with Christ. We have the right to. Let's identify with Christ. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. What are we saying? What are we saying to God that we want? So this is the call to identify with Jesus. Galatians 2, verse 20, Paul said to the Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Does that identify with Christ? Does that say how you can have the peace that passes understanding? How you can find the strength to persevere? How it will make you to be more determined to abide by the teachings of the Bible and to teach the truth and love the souls of lost men? men and women, boys and girls, and to love the brethren who have all come to Jesus for refuge and obedience to the gospel. If it doesn't, I don't know what it's saying. I don't know what these words are here for. When I read them, they're in the Bible written to Christians. They must mean something to me. They must be edifying to me spiritually. And I don't know how to do it. That is, read it 
and conclude from it any more than I need thee every hour. I need everything God offers me on this earth to be able to be faithful to Him, and I need it all of the time. Well, of course, you begin in becoming a Christian and believing in Christ, repenting of our sins and confessing our faith in Christ, being baptized by the authority of Christ in the name of the Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for the remission of sins. You begin there. Now, we have the habit. In fact, this song is many times sung as we say an invitation song. And we're a lot of denominational people. They don't want me with that. They might know what you mean what, what person means by an altar call. <laughs> and among certain churches of Christ, at the ends of sermons, they've decided, well, that's just a tradition to offer an invitation. Well, when the Word of God's taught and people are there and the Word of God's designed to move them, to persuade them, it seems like to me that's a good time to say, if you're ready and you know the truth, you need to obey it. And then we're giving you this opportunity and exhorting you to act upon the truth you've now learned and make the necessary adjustments and obedience to the truth that all must make in order to become a Christian. Now, I'm saying that right now because we also add to it, if the Christians, as we've done always, have sinned, there's a second law of pardon, and that's repentance, confession of sins, and praying God for forgiveness. Sometimes we forget, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And here's what happens. I've heard it for years. Well-meaning people, we say the plan of salvation, go over it, and we talk about the second law of pardon, and here's what we have. And if you have any other needs. What do you mean by that? If you have any other needs. Yeah, I do. I have, uh, I, I raise peas out here and they're ripe. And would you like to come? Uh, see any other needs? Oh, well, we assume that's spiritual needs, all right? What other spiritual needs does this person have? Well, one I can think of. You might want the church to pray for you for whatever temptations you're undergoing or sickness or whatever. Because I know that's authorized. All right, let's add that one to it. What other needs you have? You don't know what's going on in the minds of people out there that don't know the truth when you say, if you have any other needs. I'll tell you something I did one time that taught me very publicly not to do that anymore. We had built a new building in Ambure, Arkansas. Had Brother G.K. Wallace there for a gospel meeting. And on Sunday afternoon when we met in the building for the first time, we had a singing, and then we had an open forum. Brother Wallace took care of it. And at the end of all of it, I got up and thanked everybody for being there. You better learn from this. I did. Anybody else have any other announcements they'd like to make? A lady stood up back. She was from the Christian church, and she announced their meeting and invited everybody to come. Well, that meant that I had to say something, and I did. I tried to be as nice as I could. I just meant we can't honor that, and we can't go to it if we're faithful to God, at least for the reason she was announcing it. Now, think about that, brethren. When we say things that we've learned from other people, uh, what do you mean? You might do that in the prayers we offer because most of us have learned our prayers, the words of them, from other brethren. And most of the time, that's good. I don't see anything necessarily wrong with that. But just because somebody said it and it sounds good doesn't mean it's what ought to be said to everybody. You don't know what people need. I've got a book that talks about, it's one reason I brought up the matter, I've got peas to be picked. It's uh, 70 Years in Dixie. And it's quite a humorous book, written back in the 1890s. And it tells about, from a Christian wrote it, a gospel preacher, he tells about all the stuff that started taking place there in the 19th century and how things were done and so forth. And he tells one place where they uh, said, uh, we'd like to invite anybody to say anything they'd like to say. And uh, two or three farmers got up and offered their livestock for sale. And, and uh, they had seed peas, and they were offering that. Well, that was his need, wasn't it? <laughs> so you don't know the minds of people out there because you don't know how they think. Assume nothing. Sometimes we get up the Lord's Supper. We speak what we speak with the understanding everybody in that audience knows. Don't make those assumptions. 
Whatever you say in a public prayer, even from preaching the gospel in a sermon, or whatever you say, just assume they don't know anything and explain it accordingly. And that's not being bad, mean, hateful. It's just taking into consideration everybody in that audience, whether it's one this size or ten times this size. You can't assume pe people don't know our jargon. I say our jargon because they haven't followed if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. They haven't had drilled into them. A lot of members of the church don't nowadays. Uh, call Bible things by Bible names. Do Bible things in Bible names. Over oh, when Brother Bill Jackson had a debate with uh, Bob Ross, who I debated over here many years ago, I heard a young preacher, Baptist preacher, after it, Bill kept referring to the, the age of accountability. Well, they're Calvinists. They're born in sin. They don't reach an age to become a sinner. And I heard him go up to somebody. He's a real young guy. He said, what does he mean by age accountability? You see, that's one of those things that we used. And we don't call them revivals. I'm not saying preaching the gospel doesn't revive people. We call them gospel meetings. Where does anybody else ever call them that? Why do we choose that? Why do people who speak where the Bible seeks choose gospel meetings? Because they're trying to get away from this old revival stuff and the denominational stuff, and that's a that's perfectly good, wholesome speaking as the oracles of God. It's a meeting pertaining to the gospel. I used to begin gospel meeting by saying, "Now this is a gospel meeting." You know what that means? It's a meeting where we have convened to preach the gospel and persuade people to obey it and to strengthen Christians by the truth. Well, why have to go into all that? Everybody has to learn something sometime, and don't assume they do. And I fall back on, I'll end here as I offer this invitation. What Brother Wallace told Brother G.K., never, never underestimate the ignorance of your audience. I'm glad people, that's why we try to say there is no bad question in a question and answer session. Ask those questions. You don't learn except you ask them. But on the other hand, as a speaker, if you're grounded in the truth, learn that what you say carries something out of those people out there. So when I give the plan of salvation and when I urge members to uh, confess sins and, and when I urge people at the end of the sermon to let us know if they have prayer for sickness and we usually take care of that and what's announced in the announcements. That's fine. But don't add to it. And if you have any other needs, who knows what that is and what other needs does anybody have? but to obey the gospel, to confess sins that they need to. And when it comes to sickness or trials and tribulations, to ask for the church to pray for you. And I had me another one on that and tell me what it would be. You got a dog you want to sell? It's registered. Is that a need? Need to you. Need you out of house home. I want to get rid of it. So think, 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 think before you speak and don't just speak because somebody else said it and it sounds good. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.